Hey everyone, welcome back to the program. Now, I'm sure most of you know that Ringo replaced Pete Best as the drummer for the Beatles, but what I've always wondered is, what was Ringo doing right before he joined the group? Like, how did he end up in one of the greatest bands of all time? Or rather, why did the Beatles pick Ringo? It almost seems like one day Pete was out and Ringo was in, but of course, the truth is much more nuanced than that. In fact, when you look at the history, it's amazing it didn't happen sooner. I mean, the Beatles were thinking of asking Ringo to join the group nearly two years before it actually happened. But what's even more serendipitous about Ringo becoming a Beatle is that it almost didn't happen multiple times. I mean, Ringo nearly died before the age of seven. His family disapproved of his music career, and he almost gave up drumming right before he met the Beatles. All right, with all that said, let's dive into Ringo's life before the band to figure out how exactly Ringo joined the Beatles. I think it's important to start with Ringo's childhood because he had it rough. He grew up in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Liverpool that was rocked by bombing during World War II. He was born left-handed, but his grandmother forced him to be right-handed. When he was three, his father left the family, and when he was almost seven, his appendix burst and he was rushed to the hospital. He nearly died three times during the surgery, and even though he pulled through, after the operation, he fell into a coma that lasted for days. And even after waking up, he had to spend six months in the hospital recovering. But the worst part was, when he was almost ready to go home, Ringo fell out of his bed, ripping open his surgery scars in the process. He then had to spend another six months to fully heal. In total, he was in the hospital for the better part of a year and fell far behind his classmates. He didn't learn to read or write until he was nine. When he was 13, Ringo had to go back into the hospital when he came down with tuberculosis, which was most likely caused by his smoking habit and the sooty Liverpool air. Unfortunately, it took two years for Ringo to recover, but it was also during this time that things started to fall into place for him. As a way to boost morale in the children's ward at the sanatorium where he was recovering, music was taught to Ringo and the other children suffering from tuberculosis. This was the first time Ringo ever picked up a drum and he was in love. He wanted nothing to do with any other instruments, only drums. In fact, he refused to participate in the class unless he was given one of the drums to play. After the teacher left, Ringo continued to drum using a cabinet near his bed. Ringo was 15 by the time he left the sanatorium in late 1955, and he never returned to school. He was still too weak for manual labor and lacked the reading and writing skills to hold down an office job. His career options were limited and his future seemed bleak, but he eventually found employment at a factory that manufactured school equipment. He soon entered into their five-year apprenticeship program. Also around this time, he was basically forced to join the local teddy boy gang because as he put it, you had to associate with some gang, otherwise you were open city for anybody. The choices were you could either be beaten up by anybody in your neighborhood or by people in other neighborhoods. Ringo desperately wanted to get out of Liverpool, but he wasn't sure how he could do it with his limited skills. That would soon change, however. By early 1957, he formed his first band with some friends from work calling themselves the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group. They played any chance they could and often for free. On a few occasions, they found themselves on the same bill as another Skiffle band called the Quarrymen featuring John Lennon. While he enjoyed playing drums throughout 1957, in April of 1958, two big moments forever cemented his path as a professional drummer. Singer Johnny Ray was in Liverpool for a one-night-only show, and Ringo just happened to be walking by the hotel where Johnny was staying. Outside, there was a commotion, and looking up, Ringo saw Johnny waving to fans, and Ringo was captivated. He later said, It was one of the first times I thought, this is the job for me. Later that same day, he saw Johnny eating at a restaurant, and this was Ringo's second big moment. It clicked for him that stars are just like regular people who have to eat. He was determined, now more than ever, to make it in the music business and see his name in lights. By the spring of 59, the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group dissolved, and Ringo joined joined the Dark Town Skiffle group for about four months, and it wasn't long before Ringo was also a member of the Texans, and sometimes he would play in both bands on the same night. And keep in mind, he was still working a full-time factory job during the day, as well as taking night classes for his apprenticeship. Also in 59, Ringo got engaged to his longtime girlfriend, Jerry, and this only added pressure on him to make it in the music business because she wasn't going to put up with his late-night gigs forever. 
By the summer of 59, the Texans embraced rock and roll and changed their name to Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. They quickly became one of the most popular and busiest bands in Liverpool, playing several nights a week. By mid-February of 1960, they booked a three-month summer gig at a Butlin Seaside Resort in Northern Wales. This was a dream job for the band, basically a paid vacation with plenty of ladies looking for fun, but this put Ringo at a crossroads. On the one hand, this was the opportunity he was waiting for, a dream come true, making a living playing music. But on the other hand, this meant giving up his engineering job, throwing away the four years he put into his apprenticeship, of which he only had a year to go, and on top of all of this, it meant straining his relationship with his fiance. Everyone around him was saying he would make a mistake by quitting his job and losing all the time he put into his apprenticeship. They said he would be back home in three months without a job or a future. His fiancée, Jerry, pleaded with him not to go. She was okay with the drumming, but insisted he at least finish his last year at the apprenticeship so that he could have a trade to fall back on. His mother was more adamant, telling Ringo he would never make a living from drumming. He basically had to choose between his family or his dreams. Rigo agonized over the decision for three months, but time was running out. The Hurricanes needed to know if Ringo was in or out. With just days away from the band leaving for the summer, Ringo finally made the decision to go with them. He was pretty blunt to his fiance, not really breaking up with her, but telling her she could wait for him if she wanted. Ringo's mother and stepfather thought he was risking any chance of a good life, but I think for him it made perfect financial sense. At his old job, he was making six pounds a week plus another eight playing with the band. At the resort, he would make 16 pounds for only working 25 hours a week, and it was hardly work as he was doing what he loved. And he thoroughly enjoyed life at the resort. It was three months of dancing, drinking, and playing music. Probably some other stuff too. By early September, Ringo returned to Liverpool confident with his chosen career path. He promptly broke up his engagement to Jerry and spent the money he was saving for the wedding on a three-year-old Ford so he wouldn't have to lug his drums onto the bus anymore. He was living well and good fortune kept smiling his way as the Hurricanes accepted a residency at the Kaiser Keller in Hamburg, Germany. But this gig would prove to be more fateful than anyone could have imagined, as by October of 1960, another band from Liverpool called The Beatles joined them at the Kaiser Keller. Six nights a week, the two groups took turns playing 60 to 90 minute sets on the rickety stage, usually starting in the evening and playing well into the early morning hours, sometimes 5 a.m. The two bands became friends and hung out during the day exploring the city. It was also in Hamburg that the future Fab Four recorded together for the first time. On October 15th, they taped three songs with the Hurricanes bassist on lead vocals. Roughly six to nine acetate copies were made, but sadly none are known to exist today. It was also here that Klaus Vormann saw both bands for the first time. Of the Hurricanes, he said, what first struck me about them was that they had a fantastic drummer. He later added that Ringo often came across to the Beatles' table and he always had a joke. So every time Ringo came near the Beatles, it was happiness. Klaus also stated, I know the three of them discussed changing their drummer while they were in Hamburg because I heard them. It wasn't said too explicitly because you don't just go and steal someone else's drummer, but they always liked Ringo. By early 1961, both bands were back in England playing various gigs in Liverpool and surrounding cities. For the summer, the Hurricanes played their second time at a Butlins resort. And just like his first summer at Butlins, his time here was very enjoyable and the band did well enough that they booked the same gig for 1962. But Ringo started to feel like things were becoming stagnant with the band. He had larger ambitions as a musician and was beginning to question if the Hurricanes were going to get him there. However, in the meantime, he continued to drum for them, and they would frequently play on the same bill as the Beatles. In fact, him and Rory, along with John, Paul, and George, started hanging out quite a bit after the shows. They would often get a bite to eat or hang out at Rory's house. John and Paul liked Ringo, but it was George and Ringo that especially got along. They enjoyed hanging out in Hamburg the year prior, and their friendship only grew stronger in 1961. And so when Pete Best couldn't play the Beatles Christmas party show at the Cavern Club on December 27th, Ringo was their first choice as a replacement, and the show turned out great. I think George described it best when he said, when Ringo sat in with us, 
it felt complete. It just really happened. It felt really good. And after the shows, we were all friends with Ringo and we liked him a lot and hung out with him. Whereas Pete, he was like a loner. He would finish the gig and then he would go. Ringo filled in for Pete Best once again on March 26, 1962. The Beatles had two shows that day, one in the afternoon and another in the evening. Between the gigs, Ringo hung out with the band, and during this downtime, George asked him if he wanted to join the Beatles. The offer was very tempting, as by this time, the Beatles were considered the top band in Liverpool. In the end, Ringo remained respectful and said, yeah, I'd love to, but you've got a drummer. At this point, George Harrison became the main driving force behind getting Ringo into the band. George later said, I conspired to get Ringo in for good. I talked to Paul and John until they came around to the idea. John would later say, by then we were pretty sick of Pete Best because he was a lousy drummer, you know? He never improved. For Paul, he said that it had got to the stage that Pete was holding us back. What were we gonna do? Try and pretend he was a wonderful drummer? We knew he wasn't as good as what we wanted. Cynthia Lennon said that Pete seemed to lack the sense of humor that was such an integral part of the boys' makeup. He really didn't gel with their characters right from the very start. The Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, could sense they wanted Pete Best out of the band, but Brian was hesitant because he didn't want to disrupt the lineup as he felt the Beatles were still developing their personalities as a band, and Pete was very popular at live shows, especially with their female fans. On top of this, Brian had secured a recording contract with EMI, and he had an upcoming recording session booked. Meanwhile, Ringo was becoming an in-demand drummer in Liverpool and had his pick of bands to play with. In the first half of 1962, he had three offers come in, including playing for Tony Sheridan back in Hamburg. In the end, he decided to stay with the Hurricanes to play a spring tour in France and then a third summer season at Butlins. On June 6th, the Beatles recorded four songs at EMI Studios on Abbey Road. Producer George Martin ultimately scrapped these recordings as he deemed the drumming unsuitable for release. He insisted that they use an experienced session drummer for future recording sessions. The reason being, while Pete's drumming was great in a live setting, his rhythm was not up to George's strict standards for recording. Later in a 1965 letter, George said that Pete Best did seem to be an odd man out, and while the other three were very unified in their performance and enthusiasm, he did not seem to be a true part of the group. Now keep in mind using a session drummer was pretty common practice at this time and George Martin certainly didn't mean for the Beatles to fire Pete. But when Brian relayed this message, George, Paul, and John took it as a sign that it was time to replace Pete. Now I've already touched on the general feeling that Pete didn't seem to fit in with the band, but another big factor was their belief that if they kept Pete, they would continue to need the skills of a session drummer. They knew he wasn't going to get any better and it was important for the Beatles to have some someone they knew when they went into the studio. Ideally, this would be someone who had a hand in the songwriting, but at the very least, they wanted someone who was a member of the band. Simply, they wanted a drummer that could sound the same on the records as well as in concert. Now, the task with firing Pete fell on Brian's shoulders, but it wasn't as simple as letting him go. It turned out that Brian's contract with the Beatles was with all of them. There wasn't a clear way for letting just one member go. It took nearly two months for Brian's lawyer to devise a plan, and with that in place, on August 14th, Brian phoned Ringo, formally inviting him to join the Beatles, which, of course, Ringo accepted. Not only did the Beatles pay the best out of all the other bands he was playing with, they also had a recording contract which was something none of the other bands could offer. The Beatles were his best bet at getting out of Liverpool. Plus, he liked the guys and got along with them. For the Beatles, the feeling was mutual, but they were also getting one of the best, if not the most steady drummer in all of Liverpool. Paul McCartney later said, we knew if you shouted Ringo a tempo, he'd stick to it, which was very rare. John Lennon said in a 1980 interview that Ringo's a damned good drummer. He was always a good drummer. Pete Best was officially let go two days later on the 16th, and Ringo played his first show as an official Beatle on the 18th of August, 1962, and that's how we joined the band. You know, it's funny when you dive deep into Ringo's upbringing, you come across some funny stories, and my favorite has got to be why Ringo didn't play with his full drum kit early on, and that's because he had to take the bus to every show. So he would only bring like his bass drum and snare, like he would stand up actually, he wouldn't even bring a stool. Anyhow, uh, this one gig, 
he just happened to bring his full drum kit. I think he ended up getting a ride there, but then he didn't have a ride back, so he had to take the bus. And so here's Ringo with four big cases on the bus in the middle of the night, and, and his bus stop is about a half mile from his house, and he can only carry two of the cases at a time. And so the only way Ringo can get his full drum kit home is by moving two of the cases about 25 yards, all the while keeping an eye on the two cases behind him, set the cases he's holding down, run back, grab those two cases, and then bring them up to the other two cases and continue to do this back and forth thing for the west, rest of the way to his house. All the while, he's fearful of the local Teddy Boy gang, his own gang, mind you, that they're gonna try to jump him and steal his stuff. <laughs> I don't know, just the imagery of little Ringo. Like, I just see it from afar, just little guys just running back and forth, just like a little ant trying to get all his stuff home. Just doing the Ringo run oh man anyway folks that will do it for today i want to thank you again so much for watching thanks for your patience i know this video took a lot longer than i anticipated to come out but i i really i had so much fun putting this together i just i love this story thank you again so much for watching i'm your vinyl geek and i'll catch you on the flip side